Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. Welcome to our special grand old mess, rebuilding the GOP. That's a nice, that's a nice title. Good job, guys. Uh, today, we're going to talk about populism, national populism. What is that? What does that really mean? Is that something conservatives need to embrace? Wholly, partly, what do we do? We'll talk about the principles that conservatives need to embrace again, our first principles. And then, of course, the policy that comes out of that. That's the plan. We'll see how it goes. I'm glad you're here. I want to make two points before we embark on our journey today. First, no third party. Get that out of your brain. I know there's talk of that right after the election. It can't happen. Doesn't exist. Don't ever think about it again. There's no third party. If you're a conservative, for better or worse, you have to operate under the big tent that is the Republican Party. I'd argue this is a good thing. We don't want to be like other countries in Europe and wherever else, where there's dozens of parties and each of them has just a couple seats of Congress and they're fighting each other. Because what happens is those factions only get more extreme. The factions get more extreme and more niche. And you don't want that. It's good to have a tent because the tent moderates each of these factions and moves forward as a unified platform and a unified force. Conservatives, don't worry about third party. <clears throat> Conservatives need to focus on moving the direction of the party, not breaking off into irrelevance, stealing a third of the Republican vote and guaranteeing a unified Democratic party wins every election ever again. No third parties. Work it out in the Republican party. If you want to change the name of the Republican party or whatever, it's fine. It's gotta be two party system, that's all you do. That's all there is. Multiple party system is not better. I know a lot of people, it's like a popular talking point. It's like, oh, we gotta move away from the two party system. No, you don't. The two party system is better. Now, to prove that, I would give, and so would you, right? If you're right now, you're like, I don't know, Slater, I think we should move away from the two party system. Okay, let me, I'll, my advice for the Democrats is you should definitely form a third party. Democrats, right? They're, they're you progressives, you Bernie progressives, you need to form your own super far left party. Leave the Democrats. Oh, those Democrats, they hate you, progressives. You need to leave it and take one third of the votes with you so that Republicans win every election ever again, right? You gotta stay unified as a party. Second, uh, what do we do about Donald Trump? It's interesting, Trump hasn't been seen or heard from in a while, right? Um, I look forward to when he comes back. Just know that the media will treat him like a deranged serial killer who was just let off of death row, like snuck out of death row. Or so. They're going to treat him like bin Laden. You remember when he would like, every like year or whatever, he would make a video and he would release a video? Like they would tr they're going to treat Trump like he's bin Laden who finally came out of hiding threatening the American people with another Al-Qaeda attack. Oh, here's the, the mastermind. That's the word they would always use for, for these terrorists, right? The mastermind. Here's the mastermind behind the Capitol terrorist attack, whipping up his base yet again. That's how they're going to frame him moving forward. But don't let that stop you. Trump needs to, first of all, not run for office again. Okay. He'll be... 78 or something. <laughs> now, don't run for office again. Republicans, Trump served his purpose. First and foremost, stopped Hillary from becoming president. Well done, sir. He'll always go down as one of the greatest presidents ever for stopping that. As I said before, you should be on, uh, you should put him on Mount Rushmore for that reason alone. A hundred years from now, parents will bring their kids to Mount Rushmore and little kid will say, Daddy, why is Donald Trump there? Ah, he prevented Hillary Clinton from becoming president. It puts him right up there with the greats. Uh, what was it? He needs to uh, stop. Oh, and the Supreme Court justices. Okay. Great. Home run. He did some great things. Some missed opportunities, of course. But he did his four years. Move on. Move on from Trump. I know you really liked him. I did. But you don't need him to run again. No, he's 78. The Republican Party needs new faces. Ron DeSantis, right now, 
is seeming like a, a really exciting front runner. People really, really like Ron DeSantis. My dream ticket right now, if I had to do this right now, it's 2024, geez. But my dream ticket right now is Mike Pompeo and Rick Grinnell. How about them apples? Mike Pompeo, Rick Grinnell. And I hope Rick Grinnell runs for governor if we can recall Gavin Newsom here in California. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about these people moving forward, right? But we gotta, we gotta move on, right? The, and well, the, know this, the Republicans have a much stronger bench than the Democrats do. I mean, we saw the Democrats bench, right? We saw their bench. It was Kamala, Amy Klobuchar, Pocahontas, and Buttigieg, all right? Okay, that was the, that's their bench. It's the best they got. They got no one else. Cory Booker. Right? Republicans have a really good bench. So Trump needs to not run. He needs to transition his role from king to sage. We've talked before on the show uh, about the phases of a man's life. Six phases. Start off as the beloved son, then the cowboy stage, then the warrior stage, the lover stage, the king stage, it's in your 40s or so, and then the sage of, um, and then the, the sage stage, which is your 60s or so and beyond. So the king stage, you're, you're in charge, obviously, right? You're leading. You have people in your kingdom that you are responsible for, and you have a mission to accomplish. Right? That's great. Some men, it, well, some men have trouble acknowledging that they even have a kingdom at all, and then they destroy it and hurt themselves and the people who they're responsible for. So that's the first thing. But then some men have trouble passing that kingdom on to the next generation. A lot of men are hesitant to become a sage because they feel like that means it's over. Right? That's the, that's the end of it. It's the end of the, like, the, my power's over, my life's, my life's over, that's it. But that's wrong. The sage is an incredibly important role, maybe the most important. We need, in our society, we need more kings who want to be mentored by sages. And we need more older men who want to give advice to help the kings rule well. Trump needs to, his job now is to be a sage and to get out there and campaign and lift up the next generation of, of Trump conservatives, Trump-like conservatives, populist conservatives. And I would argue he has more power and influence as a sage than if he himself ran again. Right? We, um, we've talked a lot, about, I gotta run here, but we've talked a lot about Telamon these last few days. He's one of Alexander the Great's men. Uh, he lived life as a soldier his entire life. And something clicked in him and he wanted to be a sage now. He wanted to move on from that warrior life. Uh, and he talked about it, he talked about it with Alexander the Great. And he said, what comes after being a soldier? He didn't know. He's like, I don't even know what comes after. So many men are too scared to find out but it can be even more fulfilling than being the king. Trump needs to embrace that role moving forward. Grand old mess, rebuilding the GOP. No third party and new faces. I'm hopeful we're in a very good position. Let's just make sure we do it right. So we'll talk about that next. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special. We're talking about populism, uh, and I believe we are in the midst of a populist wave. It did not end with Donald Trump. The author of They're Not Listening, How the Elites Created the National Populist Revolution, Ryan Gerdusky is here. Ryan, how are you, brother? Good, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So let's uh, define some terms. So what is populism, and then what is national populism? Okay, so populism is an economic struggle, struggle between those who uh, are the producers and basically those who own the means, uh, the workers and the managers. And then a uh, national populism, nationalism is a struggle between global institutions and, um, inter and, and, and regional institutions and national institutions. Um, and the thing is that people who are generally globalists are also those who own the means right now, which is why most nationalists are also populist um, and why we have moved in this general direction um, and, and why that's not going away. It's not always the case. There are left-wing populists, but that's why right-wing populism has, has seen a rise. 
Okay, can you help me visualize this? Maybe with some historical examples of each, or, or what do you visualize when you think of each of these things? So a right-wing populist, a national populist, would be uh, Hungary's Viktor Orban, Italy's um, uh, uh, Matteo Salvini, um, India's um, uh, Mo uh, Mobley over in... Um, his name is not Mobley. Uh, I'm just blanking on the Prime Minister of India's name. Uh, the Prime Minister of India, though, for sure. Um, Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, mm. uh, Modi in India, that's the name, sorry. And um, and left-wing populism would be like the leader of Pakistan, like Bernie Sanders, like uh, the uh, socialist leader of the UK. Um, those would be left-wing examples of left-wing populists. What are some policies that a right-wing populist would stand for? So right-wing populists are, are different than traditional conservatives in the aspect that uh, budgets and tax cuts are not our main concern. Saving and salvation, and solving, uh, saving the nation is the main concern. So um, a question that we've all wanted to talk about for the last four years is how do we, especially since the coronavirus, how do we bring back manufacturing? How do we bring back supply chains? So we're never in a situation where the greatest country in the history of the planet cannot produce masks cannot produce ventilators, cannot deal with an onslaught of a virus that comes from a foreign country. And we talk about bringing home supply chains, hasn't been done yet, um, but not just how to bring home supply chains, how do we bring them back to the Midwest? How do we bring them back to the places that have lost out because of free trade and bad trade deals? Well, that involves an infrastructure program because the infrastructure in parts of this country makes us look like we lost the war. So um, it's about spending an infrastructure program. It's about using the powers of government and using the economy as a weapon to get the outcomes best desired for the people that vote for you. Okay, so when I hear powers of government, my a little red flag goes up. How is this different than a Bernie Sanders or AOC populism? Um, okay, so it's not about, I'm not trying to, every populists believe that there should be a floor of stability, right? No one, no one in living in America should be so destitute that they starve to death. However, um, AOC and Bernie Sanders want to give you some comfort of life while a national populist would say you should have a level of stability, you should have something, some comfort of life where you're not starving, and at the same time, you should have opportunity. So the government, government action is what caused the destruction of millions of lives, and not in the sense of, oh, it's just you know, a war or something. Government action over NAFTA, over GATT, over free trade, over normalizing trade deal with China destroyed the lives and towns of entire regions of this country. And government politicians, free marketers, Republicans sat there and said, learn a new skill, deal with it, just move to Texas, abandon the town your family was born in, abandon the town where your parents are buried, and just sit there and live in Texas now. No big problem. That's not the answer. If you're a conservative, part of conservatives believe in salv and salvation of neighborhoods and, uh, and of long traditions. That's all gone by, 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 be by believing that the free market is the uh, end all and be all. So it's saying, Use the power of the government, use the uh, weaponize the economy to get the best outcomes for people who vote for you. Because for 20 years, people, working class people in this country have voted for Republicans and they've seen an opioid epidemic, endless wars, broken borders, bad trade agreements, and the destruction of their lives and of their families' lives. So all I'm saying is use the, that same power of government that destroyed their lives and use it to sit there and bring some stability to their lives. I'm, I'm with you and I hear you. Do you, under, do you see my concern or people's concern uh, when you talk about government and picking winners and losers, it sounds like. Um, and yes, we agree that they've picked... I'm not they've picking winners and losers. ...operated poorly. I'm not picking winners and losers like Solyndra. I'm not sitting there and saying this corporation should get a, should get a check and this corporation shouldn't. I'm saying uh, Eastern Ohio should do better. I'm saying Central <laughs> Pennsylvania should do better. Or, or Detroit. Yeah. I'm not sitting there and saying, "Oh, let's make sure that the company that gave a, 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 a you know a billion dollar check to a politician should be the winner." I'm saying that there are regions of this country that have been left to die, and it's been right wing people. It's been the George Wills of the world who said, "Just move, screw you, screw your town. You all deserve to die. You stay there." No, I don't. That's not an acceptable answer. It's just not. Yeah. And that's why, what? if you continue to allow these free market zealots who uh, you know, don't speak to the concerns of average Americans, that is why Bernie Sanders is surging. That is why AOC is surging. And that's why they'll only continue to surge. 
What is the role of the elites in the rise of all this? Who, who, who are the elites and the wh what are they doing? The people who hate George W. Bush the most are the, sorry, the people who hate Donald Trump the most are the reason he became president. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, the, that is the people who created this. By living and dying with the free market, uh, and I, by the way, there, this is the big secret. I'll tell everybody right now. There is no such thing as a free market in America. The government is involved in every step of almost every market in the entire country. You can't build a house without the government being involved every single step of the way. That means there's no such thing as a free market. But being involved in the market um, to pick winners and losers, which they have, bailing out Wall Street, endless foreign wars, open borders, believing nonsense like diversity is our strength, mass immigration, all of these things. Time and time being told, if you disagree with them, sit down and shut up. You're a racist, you're an idiot, you don't know anything, you're not in our club, you just can't understand it. Eventually blood boiled and they said, screw it, I'm gonna make Donald Trump president. And Donald Trump, by not fulfilling those those, those populist issues that he ran on, because uh, his daughter decided to marry the dumbest white man in America and he let him run his presidency, uh, is the reason he was only a one-term president. What's the difference between national populism and anarcho-capitalism, which is not something I fully understand, but these are two big terms Anarch being thrown around. Basically says there should be like no government involvement. Let's just have the market dictate everything, which is also nonsense because there is no such thing as the free market. There's no industry you can actually get involved in without the government regulating it in some way. It's just the way it is. And most people do not want that. They do not want the destructive force of the market governing every aspect of their lives. People enjoy stability. They like knowing that something that that tomorrow the post office will be open. They like having stability. That's how most will govern their lives. So by running this in there and saying the market can solve every issue is a losing is a losing idea. I'll say that's what I tell politicians all the time when I when I consult for them. I say if you have to use the words freedom, liberty, or free market to discuss and win over your ideas, you're losing voters. Because most people don't know what all those terms mean. They mean kind of open-ended things or kind of buzzwords. If you can't paint a picture for me of how you want the country or the government or whatever thing you're running for to look in 10 years after you're done running it, um, you're not going to win. Maybe you'll win, uh, you know, one. what? Yeah, that's interesting, right? So you're right. So freedom, liberty. And free market. They're, they're, they're like means, <clears throat> but it doesn't paint a picture of an end. Yeah, it's, uh, it's their buzzwords. It's like when liberals say justice, it means nothing. Yeah. Environmental justice. What the hell does that mean? Like a plan has to deal with suffrage? I mean, this is nonsense, but it is a buzzword. It means literally nothing. But when AOC talks or when Bernie talks and they sit there and they say, you know, you're going to be able to go to college for free, that means something to somebody. When Donald Trump says, I'm going to build a wall, that means something. You know what that looks like and how that benefits mm -hmm. people. Um, and that's what they need to start jumping on and speak to people. Um, uh, you know, what are what are you going to do for the people that vote for you, not for the people people who donate to you? We did a segment on Monday about uh, betrayal and treachery. Uh, what do you? What emotion do you think is is most bubbling up among the people? Um, I, uh, I think that a lot of people are either on the verge of giving up or not knowing what to do. They just don't know what next. Because most people aren't political people like work on political campaigns. Yeah. They don't know what to do. And I say to people all the time, I, I, and I've been working on a long piece about this, there are a million things to do. If you want to be involved, go run for the board of your union. If you don't belong in a union, go run for the board of your company and stop all the all the stop all the stuff in the private sector. If you want to run for a school board, stop the six to nineteen project. If you want to run for city council, sponsor our programs that build Christopher Columbus statues. If you want to run for a state legislature, there's a million things you could do. If you want to run for Congress? Go ahead, do it. There's a million things everyone can do. If you want to run for anything, go be a good parent and volunteer. Or if you're too old to be a parent, go tell your child your adult children that you will help. You know watch their children so they could have more of them because intact and larger families are very, very important. There is something literally for everyone to do. It's just you need to be a self-starter and do it. Don't wait for someone to take orders and give you orders. Yeah. What is the role of national populism? You, uh, it sounds like we're, well, at first it sounded like we were talking about economic related things. I talk a lot in the show about cultural things, but you did touch on a few cultural things there with the family as well. So what's the cultural aspect of national populism that's important? 
Uh, once again, weaponize the economy. It's the greatest weapon we have. So the last one of the last great things that Donald Trump did, for example, is he ended federal contracts for corporations that that uh, that have critical race theory. So basically, if you sit there and you force your students to learn, not your students rather, but your students if they're in college, but also your employees to learn critical race theory, which believes that white people are born uh, with the stain of, of racism, they can never get rid of it, everything they do is inherently racist, you will not be eligible for a federal contract. Why doesn't every single state in the country have that same thing? We could use, we can, listen, having a tax cut for a company like Nike that sells uh, so cultural Marxism to children is not a winning thing for conservatives. I don't care as the word tax cut in it. Using the government and using the billions of dollars of government contracts to force companies and how they act and how they sell things, I think is and, and how they practice is is really is really good. Uh, also, we should be making it more economically feasible for people to have children. It costs a million dollars over the course of a child's life without, if they if they don't go to college or private school. That is insane for most people. And that is why every population in this country, except for native Hawaiians, has a fertility level under replacement. It means every generation of every group of Americans, of every race is smaller in the next generation than they are in the previous generation. And we cannot import new Americans. I don't care what anyone sits there and says to you. Someone who comes over the border yesterday is not as American as a ninth generation Wisconsin dairy farmer. It takes a long time, a lot of assimilation to all believe in the same things and to, to, and to coalesce around a similar idea. It's not going to happen tomorrow. You can't just import a million Americans from a different country, from Russia or Nigeria or France. It just it doesn't work like that. So, um, so I think promoting larger families and making it more affordable for people to have families. Most people want more children than they have, and they just can't afford to have them. Doing something about that would be a big, big priority to sit there and help American families out. I gotta tell you, Ryan, this is a totally different way of thinking than, than I've been used to. And I think that's a good thing, right? Well, hopefully, maybe you learn something, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying, I think that these are things that, sitting there and saying, uh, libertarianism is a failed concept. It's like socialism and Marxism, it's a nightmare. Sitting there and saying that the government has some ability to do something uh, is not an evil concept. Uh, could they do everything so efficiently? No, and the market can do some things more efficiently than the government can, and maybe they should take over, but they can't do everything. Um, and we have done, we have had free market capitalism and the destruction of the market for the working class for 30 years and socialism for the winner, for the, for the upper class. And people are frankly tired of it. And, it, and I'm not advocating for socialism, but there should be some kind of government protection and government advocacy on behalf of the working class of this country. They're not listening how the elites created the National Populist Revolution. James, Orion, James Gurdusky, and, and Harlan Hill as well, uh, co-authors. Co uh, Ryan, good to talk to you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it again. Thanks, man. All right, more coming up on the populist uprising that is occurring in this country. Mike Slater, true story, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special grand old mess, rebuilding the GOP. I want to go right to our next guest, Lenny McAllister. He's the senior fellow of the Commonwealth Foundation and also the CEO of the Pennsylvania Coalition of Public Charter Schools. Lenny, how are you, brother? Mike, how, did, how are you doing today, sir? Really good to talk to you. Let, let's start with charter schools real quick. Obviously, we got a lot of things to talk about here, but let's do charter schools. Um, we talked last uh, earlier in the week with uh, Corey DeAngelis uh, from the Reason Foundation about all these states, 15 states, that are now having introducing bills to, to have more uh, school choice, which is wonderfully hopeful. What the heck has taken so long for the Republican Party? Why do we still have a federal Department of Education after Ronald Reagan ran on getting rid of it? And what do Republicans need to do to make this the number one most important issue? I think the first thing that they need to do, Mike, is embrace the 10th Amendment on this. You know, we talk about the 10th Amendment on a lot of different things, and we talked about it when it came to the pandemic and reopening the state economy. But when it comes to school choice, if you truly embrace that 10th Amendment and you say the states know best and you allow education to be drilled down, that gives the power to the state legislatures, which a majority of them are still Republican, still conservative, and still fundamentally believe in school choice. They could subsequently put the policies into place 
to allow the money for state funding to follow each student to the school that best fits their needs rather than going to the institutions where we're going to continue to see schools be locked up and closed for months on end. The truth is, if you want every American child to be a contributor to American society over the next dec set of decades, you have to allow them to go to the best school that suits their needs so that if they're going to be a carpenter, so be it. If they're going to help rebuild these bridges like we have here in Pittsburgh, so be it. People forget we had a highway collapse in Minnesota not too many years ago. You're going to have to fix the infrastructure just as much as you're going to need more doctors. You're going to need more scientists. You're going to need more entrepreneurs to create new types of businesses in the 21st century to not only rebuild our economy domestically, but also continue to lead internationally when it comes to the economy. That's how we keep our country safe. That's how we move forward as a nation. What's the political hurdle of getting this done already? I mean, Milton Freeman was talking about this in the 70s. What are, what's the holdup? We have politicized education. And when you have the labor union movement deeply entrenched in education, now it becomes an issue where it's not about the child anymore. It becomes mm -hmm. an industry for jobs. Too many people in education K through 12 see education as an industry for good jobs and pensions and not an institution for the best education for each child possible. And that's your fundamental difference. As long as it's an industry and not an institution, you're going to have this inconsistency where kids drop off the radar like we're seeing now during the pandemic, and you're going to continue to see generational poverty that's avoidable take over many cities throughout America. I'm so, it's my biggest disappointment with President Trump that he didn't get rid of the Department of Education. Is that is that a pipe dream? Should I stop even hoping that that's a thing? It's just amazing. We went our, all of American history until 1979 without yeah. it. And now we think we can't live without it. It, it annoys me. I think part of it is people want the comfort of having a federal Department of Education, but you can have a streamlined Department of Education that fully embraces and empowers the states to find yeah. different solutions. Again, part of it is supposed to be, where's the innovation? How are we going to be cutting edge and be successful? And, and too often when you see big government from on high, it's usually bureaucratic, it usually slows down the process, it usually jams up the money, and it pays for things it doesn't need, and it has to vet new ideas far too long so that they stop being new ideas and they start being status quo or broken ideas. And as you said, against the 10th Amendment, it, it becomes a national government instead of supporting yes. the, the states. I hate it. Uh, you ran for Congress a couple years back in Pittsburgh in a, in a blue collar town. Uh, what does the Republican Party need to do moving forward to appeal to that demographic? Well, part of it does start, Mike, with school choice, but it also goes back to how do you empower people in these communities? And how do we educate folks in these communities? For example, when I was campaigning in 2006, one of the things I talked about was how we needed to get rid of some of the regulations from Dodd-Frank and remove the legacy of that so that we can restart entrepreneurial spirit once again. And I brought up the example of, you remember that credit union that was on the corner that provided the mortgage for your family, that provided the, the business loans for the three or four businesses that your friends used to have for years here in the Hill District or in Homewood, Brushton and the like. Well, when Dodd-Frank came about after the 2008 crisis, the bigger banks bought up the smaller banks and the credit unions and they went away. We used to create hundreds of banks annually, different entities that loaned money and supported different type of customers. Now the big banks were too big to fail and the smaller banks ended up being too small to, to survive. And as a result, mm -hmm. the small guy lost out in America. And that's why you're seeing a, a decrease of wealth and opportunity in these regions. You start rolling back regulation, you start inspiring innovation through good small, mark, uh, small government and free market policy, these folks will actually start looking at the Republican Party as a viable option in November elections. All right, so uh, our last guest was super thought-provoking on this stuff, and he said you need to create a, a concrete vision. So what I heard right there, this, this is how my brain went. I heard Dodd-Frank, and I was like, whoa, I haven't heard that name in 10 years, right? Nor yeah. could I even like recall exactly what it is. But you made it concrete with the effects, right, about the credit union. But what's the concrete vision next? What is the Republican Party going to provide now if, we vote, if I were to vote for that person? Well, number one, 
education equity. Number two, entrepreneurial opportunities. Number three, safety in communities. People just want to be treated fairly. People want to have the opportunity to move to the next level in life. Even in the most livable city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm a native, it's also one of the hardest cities in the nation for African-Americans to live in, to have a decent job, to buy a home, to be able to move forward, and to have a long-lasting life. Generally speaking, there's a 15-year gap in life expectancy between white Pittsburghers and black Pittsburghers. If the Republican Party can start addressing these things, make health care more affordable, make opportunities more accessible, make good schools more accessible, and show it through tangible policies, these things line up pretty fast. And it's very easy to see people say, well, I used to be a Democrat because my granddaddy and my daddy was a Democrat, but the Republican Party has the policies for me and they are working with me and for me and respect me. And I'm going to go in a new direction. How did Trump not do that, especially with the gas? You know, uh, Biden's going to ban fracking. I mean, everyone assumed Western Pennsylvania would fall uh, as red as red could be. Where did Trump miss the boat? Tone. Sometimes the, the, the tone matters. Sometimes the perception matters. And you have to be mindful of that. His tone worked with some Americans. It didn't work with other Americans. There's a way to thread that needle where we can be consistent with our conservative principles, but also reach a hand out and say, come over this way. Work with us more. We're going to do more with you and build that bigger group of individuals that sees that free market principles really make a difference. Now, part of the problem, Mike, is the fact that many Republicans, when they get to govern, don't really believe in free market principles. They don't really believe in smaller government. They just believe in, well, we need to have the big R in front of big government. That's not how it works. We have to get back to our principles in a holistic sense and then sell that to more people with a tone that matters and a tone that's empowering for more Americans across our diversity. If we can do that, and I think we can, that's how we become successful. I uh, wish you were here with our last guest, uh, Ryan Gerdusky, who uh, wrote a book called They're Not Listening, and he's uh, a populist. And he advocates for, for national populism um, and, and spoke critically, I'd say, of free markets, particularly when it came to tariffs, right? So how does the Republican Party moving forward balance their, I believe, rightful esteem of free markets uh, and, and free trade with the populist angle of, well, look where free trade got us in Pittsburgh and look where free trade got us in the Rust Belt and all these other cities. How do you, how does the Republican Party balance populism with free trade moving forward? I mean, there's two aspects of that. Number one, Mike, one can make the argument that Pittsburgh got this way because there was an overbalanced um, emphasis and importance on unions. And that kind of drove us out of being competitive on a global scale when it came to steel, especially when the, when the Japanese were really able to ramp up their economy after World War II and start really humming in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s. People forget that we were selling Japanese cars at one heck of a clip in the 80s, and that drove down the steel industry in America as well as the car industry in America. So one could make the case it wasn't free market. It was kind of the overbalanced um, importance of unions in the mix. But with that said... What's more popular than populism is prosperity. And the way you create prosperity, and I think during this Black History Month, a forgotten African-American is Thomas Sowell, who reminds people that the ladder of success is truly a ladder. And even if you find yourself at the lowest rung, if free market principles and a free market truly works, you don't stay at that lowest rung. You might make minimum wage as a 19 year old, but with increased skills and increased education, you move up the ladder for others to move beneath you and you all rise up together. There's a reason why poverty in Central America has been eradicated in many, many areas. There's a reason why poverty in parts of Asia has been eradicated in many, many areas. It's because free market principles and entrepreneurism has allowed people to climb out of poverty and find opportunities for their lives that they just didn't have for generations prior. That's more popular than populism. Yeah. And unfortunately, people are too caught up in the taste of the candy and, and the promise. It's like I often say, you know, you can wrap cyanide in chocolate, it still doesn't make it candy. And that's kind of how populism and socialism is. It's a very good promise, but without any substance, that's going to really help you have a vibrant life moving forward. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. So what I'm seeing is populism is a result, perhaps, of n lack of prosperity. 
So people are not prosperous, don't feel upward mobility potential or feeling it. Therefore, they call for populist actions. But you're saying if we can, you can short circuit that by, or circumvent that by being prosperous <laughs> and you become prosperous through free markets. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, is that fair? First, is, is, is that is that a good yes, translation? And, and, and I think that what people fail to realize is that, you know, whether it's populism or socialism, you have this level of frustration. Now, the reason why you end up capping the success of free markets is that's where regulatory measures come into play, where if you have dumb regulations, unnecessary regulations and redundant regulations, entrepreneurs cannot spread the prosperity. They cannot continue to make profit and reinvest in people. People cannot find the next opportunity to go into another level of government, not government, excuse me, another level of business. They can't find ways to expand without hitting their heads on government. And as a result yeah, of that, yeah. we have to sit there and say, look, how do we allow businesses to be able to grow so that we can allow people to fulfill their potential? That's what we have to get back to when it comes to free market yeah. principles, whether it's at the state level or things that we're seeing on high from Capitol Hill and the White House. All right, I got one more question. Uh, does a Republican candidate need to speak either differently or with different policy to the black family in inner city Pittsburgh and the blue collar white family in the Pittsburgh suburbs? Differently, but not with different, different policies. You, you, can, you can make the case on an individual level across the diversity of, Amer of America with the same principles if, Mike, to be quite honest, if you know your principles. I would dare say that the Republican Party and conservative movement has been a little bit of all over the place over the last one to two decades. And as a result, we don't have a cogent message. We don't have a cogent product to sell voters. And as a result, we don't have confidence from a majority of voters in America these days. It's up to us to learn what those principles are so that we feel comfortable going into the living rooms, whether it's through social media or through door knocking or anything else, to talk to the African-American family, the blue collar family, the rural family, and show the same principles, but different examples of how those principles will translate over to help their lives be more prosperous, safer, and better overall. So same principles, different policy, or, or different way of speaking? How would you define that? Different way of speaking. It's gonna be the same policy, but if you know your policy and your principles well, you'll be able to extrapolate how it makes sense for the urban family of five, just as much as it makes sense for the rural family of six. But if you don't know your principles yeah. and your policies very well, you either try to make it all make sense, but it's two different things, or you just ignore yeah. one or the other. It's yeah, the same yeah. principles and policies, speaking differently, but understanding your audience and understanding your convictions better than we do yeah. right now collectively. Uh, Lennon, we got to run, but I want to uh, I want to talk later another day about uh, some examples, some specifics of that. But but that's definitely uh, the right answer. Lenny McAllister, Absolutely. Lenny, let's do it again, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you, kind sir. God bless you Wonderful. all. Wonderful. Thanks, man. You too. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, welcome back to our special grand old mess, rebuilding the GOP. We've had different perspectives on the show today about what we need to do moving forward, but the most important thing is it needs to be a united front, whatever that ends up looking like. Anna Paulina Luna is here. She's the executive director of the APL PAC, and she ran for Congress uh, uh, just outside the, the Tampa area. Anna, how are you today? Good, thank you so much for having me on. Really good to talk to you. Speak to me about unity here, because I know there's a talk here about like even potentially third parties or something, and that's just a disaster, no? Yeah, um, so I, I actually did a video on this. I think it's a huge mistake for people to say, oh, I'm gonna leave the GOP and we're gonna start a new one. First of all, you know, the Democrat party has such a united front. And if people were to leave the GOP, ultimately what would happen is it would put the Democrats and their very progressive, very radical agenda in power while we're busy infighting. So what I tell people is if you really wanna see change, it has to come from within. And that's actually part of the reasoning as to why I decided to run for Congress because I realized that the core principles of what the GOP are, which is something that you know President Trump, I think really knocked the socks off on, um, those need to stay around. And this old way of 
doing things. It's no longer effective in an era where you have Democrats especially focusing on identity politics. What do you say to the people who say, oh, I'm sick of voting for the lesser of two evils and Republicans are just the same as Democrats in the end, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what do you say to that? I say to those people, if you see a problem and you realize that it needs fixing, but you're not doing anything about it, you're part of that problem. So whether you're getting involved locally, like let's say that, for example, you think that there might be an issue with voter fraud. Well, you know, you can run for supervisors of elections. You can, you know, organize volunteers to be poll watchers. But if you're not engaging in the process, then you can't simply just sit there on the sidelines and then expect a different result. That's, you know, the recipe for madness is doing the same thing over and over again and not making a change. It's interesting, and I hope out of this election, and, I, and this special has really uh, inspired me and encouraged me about all this. I, it's, it feels like, I hope, I hope this is reality, it feels like more regular people are going to want to step up, but, and I don't know if I just put my own bias on this, gosh, that sounds so hard and difficult and time consuming and expensive and perhaps futile. Ah, inspire me more, Anna. So I actually was one of those normal people. In fact, you know, for someone like myself, my husband's still in the military. Um, we don't have any crazy stock portfolio or, you know, any trust funds. We're just normal people. And it is a little bit intimidating. It's kind of nerve wracking when you turn on the television and you see this constant just bombardment of negative as to what happens when you get involved in politics. But what I tell people is, you know, being in the political arena is no different than when you have a disagreement with someone at the supermarket. You know, you're still going to go forward and buy your groceries. You might not agree with the person in line, but, you know, replicate that on a massive scale. And I know that sound, might sound like a weird analogy, but, you know, it's not as bad as people say that it is. And sure, it can get nasty, but I'm a firm believer in that it is what you make of it. Yeah, you might be attacked, but it's no different than when you fight with someone on social media. So, you know, going back to kind of how the GOP can really assist with this is, one, you are right. We need the GOP to actually back these candidates that have what it takes takes to fight the identity politics that the left puts forward. And then also too, you know, I was, you know, after my campaign in November, um, I actually went to do boots on the ground work in Georgia because I wanted to see what was happening out there. I really believed in helping, you know, to win those races. And I will tell you that, you know, I think what the GOP needs to be doing, especially is training these new candidates on how to interact with people of all color and creed and doing a lot of minority outreach because I didn't see that. And not that I am one for identity politics, I'm not. But, you know, you have the Democrats that really do create these victim style mentalities among uh, minorities, and when you don't have someone else hearing a different different opinion, it can lock those people into feeling isolated to just vote for one party. Yep, I love that. Um, what is it the Democrats do that activism wise that you think Republicans can take a lesson from? So I again actually um, replicated this. You know, Democrats are really good at. I think organizing also too, you see a lot of the Democrat, I think mega donors that are willing to, I think, give money to these grassroots causes that do training, organization, I mean, phone banking and direct community interaction is so big, but also too, I mean, not that I do not support BLM, but you saw the activism aspect in regards to their arranged protests, what they were doing. And if Republicans, not getting violent, but if Republicans were to replicate that volunteer system, that line of communication, I think that our ideas, I think if most people were exposed to them instead of what they hear on the mainstream media, I think that it would cause a fire in people's hearts to really fight for this country and to really embrace the founding principles of what this country is based upon. Yeah, it's so interesting because I don't know if it was Thomas Sowell who made this point or Friedman. I don't know who made it. But uh, Democrats are more collectivist by nature and Repo Demo uh, conservatives are more individualistic by nature. So it, like, we're just not good at doing those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're just not good at coming together and uniting and for activist causes like the left isn't. But we're also very local oriented and community focused as well. So we should be good at it. What, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I think that there's a, I mean, I came across a ton of small business owners, but even you telling those small business owners, like, look, you can't any longer, I think, especially in this political climate, um, not somehow get involved locally in local politics, yeah. because we saw with the COVID shutdowns that, you know, so many small businesses were permanently canceled because of the local policy that the local governments were putting in place. And so I know it's, 
there's a lot of people that I think are afraid, you know, they're afraid of being attacked. But when you realize in retrospect that, you know, over 75 million, is that the number that, you know, voted for the Republican yep. movement? Some, a lot of them that were independents as well, a lot of minorities. I mean, you realize that you're not alone. And I think that when you remind yourself of that, it's no longer just, you know, I'm going to be targeted. It's that your entire community, you have a lot of people that are behind you that might not just necessarily be as vocal as you're being. Yeah, there's a price of not getting involved uh, as well. Exactly. Uh, you, speak, you speak of these principles of the conservative movement that we need to rally behind. Uh, let's talk a few principles, and then we can talk some few, uh, a couple policies too. But what are the big principles? Absolutely. I think one of the most important right now is the Second Amendment. And I say that because, you know, ultimately the Second Amendment is not just for hunting. It's not just for, you know, you wanting to do it for sport. It's ultimately was put in place. And, you know, I'm not a prep or anything or a conspiracy theorist, but it's put in place to empower the individual and the citizen over their government. And ultimately, when you don't have the Second Amendment, you and you see throughout history in many countries, what happened shortly thereafter after the population is disarmed. So I think that that should be our number one issue, especially now we're seeing, you know, the, I think it was the Washington Examiner, Washington Post, it was Washington Post that had done an article um, talking about how white supremacy was being empowered by the Second Amendment and how we need to, to quote unquote, disarm hate. That's the farthest thing from the truth. You know, I'm a survivor of armed robbery, a school shooting, and ultimately a home invasion. And I'm the first one to say that that doesn't, you know, just affect those quote unquote hate groups. It affects everyone. So that's something that we need to keep an eye on. But also, too, I think a huge one that a lot of people aren't talking about is, you know, our spending. We have these people in office that, you know, don't understand. And I don't think, I think they understand, but I don't think that they care that there's an entire young generation that's going to have to pick up the tab on a lot of these spending bills that they're pushing through. And these are massive spending bills. So think about the legacy in the country that you're leaving for your children. And then the other thing would be, is that, you know, I'm always going to be a firm, you know, believer in science, but I also believe that, you know, if you want to believe in science, you have to argue for pro-life causes and topics. And I can tell you that had I not had a developmental biology course, that I essentially probably wouldn't be as hardcore as I am from a scientific perspective on pro-life. But now that I have had that, you know, you can't say that you are a believer in climate change, but not a believer in pro-life. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So it's uh, pro-life, Second Amendment, and uh, spending. I think those yeah. are three top issues. Uh, on the Second Amendment one, uh, I think we need to go, we need to tap back into the beginning of COVID when there was so much fear going around uh, of what's going to happen next. And that grocery stores were closing and all this stuff. And remember, gun sales shot through the roof. And it wasn't just <laughs> crazy conservatives. It was progressives who were like, oh, I get it now. Uh, yeah. Why the Second Amendment's important. And we got to tap back into that, among other reasons that, that you've experienced too. <laughs> I mean, there is, it's funny because I am still friends with people in California. That's where I'm originally from. And I remember hearing people call me and say, I don't understand. Like, I'm not able to get a gun. I went to the gun store. Like, they won't give it to me. Same uh, day. I'm like, yeah, because of those policies. <laughs> yeah, move to Florida. <laughs> what, do you guys have a delay in Florida or can you just go get one? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, in Florida, you can, if you have your concealed carry, which I do, you can pick up same day. Beautiful. Florida. Awesome. Uh, and I, so I just, just Florida and California, so I'm in San Diego. So it's wild to me that Disneyland is closed still, yet Disney World is open. And, and I, say, like, I just mean Florida and California in every single regard with COVID. They're two totally different countries the way they're operating, but Florida's doing great, right? Florida's doing great, and I really applaud Governor DeSantis because I think early on, like you were mentioning earlier, you know, conservatives tend to be individualistic. Um, I argue that conservatives tend to be very analytical in regards to our approach process, especially on policy. And I know that DeSantis was very concerned about COVID because of the fact that we have an older population of voters here in Florida, and obviously you want to protect your elderly. But when you started to te um, started to see statistics coming out, especially from some of these epidemiologists out in um, California, actually, I think USC put out a study, and it was saying even early on that the survival or that the mortality rate was fairly low, and that the survival rate for COVID was very high. What you really 
realize is that a lot of these people, um, I think, were using COVID for political purposes in order to try to cause more issues before the election. And I don't think that that's right. We saw, you know, less than 24 hours after Biden was inaugurated that you saw all these Democrat governors start to open their economies. And that's wrong. And I really applaud DeSantis for in this, you know, in the face of the cancel culture saying, we're not going to do that. He kept people, one, employed, and then also two, he saved businesses. Yeah, I think DeSantis is on the, the, the front runner right now for 2024, but that's a yeah. long time away. Anna <laughs> Paulina Luna, uh, follow on Twitter, Real Anna Paulina and Anna APL uh, Pack. Anna, let's do it again. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Have a wonderful day. Uh, all right, that's our special. Uh, I like the idea that we got to get back to our principles, get to the policies that speak to uh, all types of people. Uh, we got to get more boots on the ground. We got to get more people involved. It's all the same old stuff, but just don't be afraid to get out there and do it. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word.